So thank you. Join me in welcoming. Wow. Uh, uh, people are standing in the back. But actually, being in the back means you can leave and you won't be noticed if, if you don't like the talk. <laughs> OK. Uh, this is uh, the title slide. Let me s make clear that uh, the work I'm talking about, I will sometimes mistakenly say I when I mean we. Uh, the, the work I'm talking about is work done by me and uh, Lenore. And uh, we are equal participants in this. Uh, so uh, can a machine be conscious? Here's the, uh, so here's what I'm going to do. I'd like to start off by uh, at least telling you what I think consciousness is. You know, different people have different uh, notions of what's conscious, what consciousness is. But for me, what it is, it's what you see, what you hear, what you feel. You know, if you have a stomach ache, that you're conscious of that. So consciousness is all that. And it includes your dreams and also um, your inner speech. Do you talk to yourself? Yes. <laughs> Amanda says yes. Uh, I've, I've asked uh, people who are deaf if they talk to themselves. And, and yes, they do. They use sign language. So it's a visual. Uh, speech, uh, and uh, I suspect that dogs also talk to themselves, but they use some language called doggish, and I don't know <laughs> what it is. Uh, I only recently learned that uh, with dogs, if their tail wags to the left, it's interpreted differently than if it wags to the right. And we humans don't know their language, but that's, that, that's interesting. Uh, okay, so. Uh, here are examples of uh, consciousness. So uh, the, the example I like is you, I, I don't know if this happens to you. Uh, you go to a party, you see somebody whose you, name you should know, uh, but uh, you don't remember it. And so, you know, it's a little embarrassing, but you go around and you get some wine and, and then uh, half an hour later, it pops into your head, Brian. Ah, that's the name. <laughs> OK, so this is an example where you are consciously asking for a name. And uh, you, you don't know where that name comes from. But your unconscious is working on that. And that's the reason that half an hour later, that name can pop into your head. It's been working on this problem. So. Uh, Here's um, where, where I'm coming from. Uh, I, would, I believe it should be possible to build a machine that uh, is conscious and has free will and feels the torment of pain and the ecstasy of joy just as much as any human. In other words, I, I come from, uh, I, 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 uh, my sense is that uh, we know physics, we know, we know, uh, uh, how things work. It's been a really remarkable thing, and I think that the physics we know is enough to explain these things. Not everybody agrees. In fact, very few people agree. It's often called the hard question. Uh, the easy question is building a robot that feels pain or feels joy, and the hard part is building a robot that really, f well, the, the easy part is building one that simulates feeling pain, simulates feeling joy, and the hard part is making it so it really does feel. So that's what I'm after. I, it's called the hard problem. OK. So the machine is to really experience qualia, uh, like the ache of pain, the ecstasy of joy, and not just simulate the experience. Uh, and we succeed if appropriate, yeah, we succeed. How do we tell if we succeed? You can find YouTube videos on the web of, of robots that are apparently in pain. They look like they're in pain, but you know that, that, they, that they're stimulating it. And how do you tell when they really feel? I think we have to build this thing. And I would say that we build it so that it's not designed in any special way to feel ecstasy. or to, But it will 
it will, it will emerge. Those feelings of pain and joy should emerge from the architecture and not be programmed in. And if by not programming in, we can get that, those uh, feelings to emerge, then I'd say we're on our way. Okay, so our view of consciousness, uh, consciousness is the property of all properly organized systems here, uh, and that it's the architecture, not the particular, uh, whether it's made out of transistors or neurons is, is not the point, okay? <coughs> so, uh, so th let me also explain that uh, this, this, uh, this wonderful place has many excellent neuroscientists. Uh, I am not a neuroscientist, I'm a computer scientist. I'm a theoretical computer scientist. And uh, wh wh what, what can I as a theoretical computer scientist possibly hope to do? So I'm gonna try to do something which is what, uh, uh, something that uh, a long, I'm gonna take a lead from uh, Alan Turing. Uh, Alan Turing, it turns out, actually did, um, um, uh, uh, he, he designed a computer, which he called the ACE computer. Uh, and uh, there was a baby ACE computer built, but uh, there was a real computer that he completely designed down to the resistor values and the capacitor values, everything you might want. He even had a, a said it, cost, it would cost 11,000 pounds, whatever that was at the time, uh, to build it. It was really... But besides actually building that, which amazes, besides designing that, he also designed a very, very simple computer, which we nowadays call the Turing machine. And this very simple computer, you know, high school students can build working examples of the simple one because it is so very simple. And uh, the the idea, what, the idea that Turing had with, with, the, uh, with this very simple Turing machine is that he was interested in what can a computer do and what can it not do. And he needed this very simple model in order to be able to say what it can do and what it can't do and to prove that some things cannot be done. In other words, it's not possible to write a program for a computer to decide if another program will halt in general. So it's called the halting problem. And this is work that came out of Turing. So I would like to try, we, Lenore and I, would like to try to do the same sort of thing. And what we're, gonna, what we're doing is we're defining something called the conscious Turing machine. The idea behind this, it's, uh, the architecture of this is different from Turing's machine. And the intent is different. Turing was interested in deciding what problems can or cannot be solved by a, a computer. I'm interested in how it does consciousness arise. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna show you how the conscious Turing machine is defined. And then I will try to point out from this how a robot consciousness could arise from this. And in also how uh, free, uh, freedom of the will could arise from this, and also how the agony and the ecstasy could arise from this model. Now, I, again, I, when I tell people that I'm doing this and I have some ideas for how agony and ecstasy could arise, a lot of people turn around and, and that's it. They won't have anything more to do with me because that's crazy. <laughs> it, it's interesting how very... Uh, how how they they won't even listen. It's just so so. But uh, here you are. You're sitting and you're listening, and so I have <laughs> I have a chance to maybe do something. Uh, I do want to make this point that I'm going to distinguish human consciousness from robot consciousness. Uh, I'm going to be talking about robot consciousness, and every so often I will uh, uh, point out the resemblance to human consciousness. Uh, or you may do that yourself. But uh, basically, um, uh, it's robot consciousness. I'm interested in, uh, we do believe that the def definitions and insights for what we call robot consciousness will shed light on human consciousness. So again, the, the conscious Turing machine we define here is a, 
at best a gross simplification of a brain. It has very little of what's in the brain. It's, I'm trying to get just enough to be able to explain consciousness and uh, the ecstasy and agony. Uh, it's related to a real brain the way a Turing machine is, and I'm not trying to, we, we are not trying to get an exact model. Our goal is to understand consciousness. Uh, so in what follows, we distinguish the consciousness defined in our model from the consciousness in the, in the brain. Okay, so having said that, we are greatly inspired by cognitive neuroscientists and philosophers and psychologists. And uh, these are a few of the names. And I'm going to start with, uh, in the upper left-hand corner, you see Bernie, Bernie Bars. Uh, he's there because he's alphabetically the first of these. <laughs> but actually, he came up with a very wonderful model of, um, of the brain, uh, an attempt to understand consciousness. It, it turns out that in 1870, there was a man, a Frenchman, named Hippolyte Ten. I think, I don't speak French. So you, anyway, uh, who came up with a, this notion of a, a stage representing what we are conscious of, and the audience representing all the unconscious processors in our brain. So this, this was great, and then nothing much came of it till Bernie Bars came along. And he came along just before fMRI was invented, and um, because of that, I believe, uh, this, this could start to take off to take off this whole notion of consciousness. Uh, but it's more than that. Bernie Bars also gave us a kind of an, an idea of what, uh, how the brain should be architected. So, so there's Bernie. He was also at Berkeley for quite a while. Uh, so so uh, uh, I, I love what he, uh, what he has done. Let me now tell you his, uh, his model. His, it's a theater analogy, and uh, he says that uh, conscious awareness can be viewed as an actor on the stage, and that and only that is what you're conscious of. But what's going on on the stage is being viewed by all the members of the audience. And if you ask, what's that person's name, so you don't know where, which processor has that information, but it's there somewhere, and you hope the processor that's there, seeing that you want the answer, will pop it into your, into your head. Okay. So there's uh, Bar's Theater, and this is the model that he uh, pr proposes. Uh, it's a, a, a very nice model, but it doesn't have the details I want. I would like to have a really fully well-defined model. Uh, where I could actually define consciousness. Okay, so here's the conscious Turing machine. It's, uh, let me just say it's uh, more formal, but I don't feel I'm still there. There are, there are, there are bits and pieces I have to finish, fi uh, we have to finish with, uh, but we, we have hopes that we're getting there. So you understand what I'm trying to do here? I'm gonna try to give you this model. And the point of the model is that it's the architecture of this model that I think is what it accounts for our, con our consciousness. It's an architecture that's different from the architecture that's currently used for any of our computers. It's quite different. Okay, so here's the, the model we're starting off. Uh, there's this short-term memory. It's called often working memory. There are a lot of people there. You can sit on the floor over here. Yeah, anyway. So there's a working memory. Uh, uh, I call it short-term memory, but it's probably the psychologists call it working memory. That's what we're conscious of. We are, to some extent, conscious of the uh, input. I had uh, here before uh, a picture of a house. Do you remember it? Describe it for me. It was a house turned upside down. House turned upside down. Good. You have any more information you can add to that? Yes. There was a little doghouse upside down. There was a little doghouse upside down there. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yes. Open dumpster. Open dumpster. There was that too. Toboggan and bicycle. Toboggan and bicycle. Yellow bicycle. Yellow bicycle. Did you see? Did you all see it? Uh, it's amazing, but I think in this model, what we have stored is not that picture. We just don't have enough. 
in our head to be able to store that. What we have is essentially a description of what's there, some short description. It can be explained in English, but of course in our brain it would be stored in brainish, not English. <laughs> so here's the external input. There is the uh, upside down house. This, by the way, is a real house. It's in Moscow. It's a quite a nice tur uh, tourist attraction. Uh, d does anybody see the stairs going up to the front door? <laughs> and uh, and uh, everything, is, the dog is up there. It's upside down. Everything inside is gl glued to the ceiling. And uh, it's a, really a fun house to, to visit. Uh, what I'm going to. Uh, talk about is what's going on in short-term memory. Um, let me m mention, I don't, do you remember uh, perhaps you seeing Yoda lifting a spaceship and wondering, especially when you're a kid, can I do that? Can I lift a spaceship? <laughs> and, you know, you try and it's really kind of, you know, but we, that's how we learn what we are versus what everything else is. We, we know that we can move our hand, uh, but uh, can't move Amanda's hand. It just won't move for me. And, uh, you know, babies, you can sort of see them when they're learning that, wow, I can do this. And discover, oh, I can do the other one, too. And that's how you learn who and what you are. Uh, so here's you. I'm putting you down as Yoda, but you know, trying to imagine lifting that rock. And what you do is you actually try to lift. Uh, but whether or not you're a actually able to do that, well, the, the way you tell is really by, by looking. You have no idea. You give the instructions, lift the rock, but whether or not you succeed, well, you have to actually look to be able to see, OK? Uh, so an example of that sort of thing is, can you, can you wiggle your ears? But uh, you know, you can try. And then you won't know until you look in the mirror and see if you succeeded. Okay. So I uh, have to get to this. So here's short-term memory on top and the unconscious audience down at the bottom. Uh, 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 just a point is that everything here is dynamically changing, especially, you know, that I have there, that external world is dynamically changing, but so are all these memories and these processors. Okay, the, this slide and the, the, the next few slides are really the meat of this model. And in this model, we have a tree representing the fact that ev whatever's in short-term memory is broadcast to all of the unconscious processors. There are a huge number of unconscious processors. I think of every neuron, each one of our 10 to the 11th neurons, as being an unconscious processor. So there's a huge number of unconscious processors. I'll just say 10 to the 11th. But remember, I'm, I'm interested in uh, robot consciousness. I don't really know. I just So anyway, so <laughs> there is this tree. And whatever's up there is broadcast down to the bottom. This is, I represent this as a binary tree, but it could be m more. But for the simple model, I want a binary tree. And that's OK, because you can get down very, very quickly from a, a single node at the top to 10 to the 11th neurons at the bottom. OK, so this, this will do for what we do want. And this is fast broadcast from what's up there down to what's below. And then there's the question of how does the information get back up to the stage? The, there's a processor there. You know, there is a processor that's concerned with faces. It's wonderful. That, that there's a processor in our brain that's concerned with faces. You, you know, nowadays you can find these cameras that will put blocks around all of the faces. It'd be lots of blocks in here. It's wonderful. Well, there's a processor that does that. And there are also processor that will name the faces that it knows. This goes on in a part of our brain called the fusiform face area. But the, the, the important thing is there are many different processors. And uh, their information goes up. And they have to, this information goes up, but it's got to go up more slowly because which information will go up? One, one processor has some information, and another processor has some other information. How, uh, how do they decide what actually gets up there? What's, the short-term memory is tiny. I'll explain 
why the model requires uh, it to be tiny. Even though we can have really big short-term memories, you'll see why it has to be tiny. Um, I mean, ba basically the idea is that I want all of the processors down here paying attention to what's on the stage, not just one processor paying attention to this and another processor paying attention to that. I want them all paying attention to exactly the same thing. And the way you can get that is by making that short-term memory that what we are conscious of small. Uh, here's how uh, uh, information goes up. So what, uh, uh, what, I'm, what we have here is there are these processors, and there are triples associated with each processor. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm representing them as, uh, for example, pain minus 5. It really should be pain, then leg minus 5. There's the pain or the address of the processor that feels the pain. There is the location or whatever is important for the stage uh, is next to that, so pain, maybe left knee, and then a weight of some sort. And that weight comes about because you know, you have these uh, nociceptors, these, these nerve fibers that send information up. And uh, if, if uh, only a few fibers fire, fire, there's not too much. If a lot of fibers fire and there, there's a higher frequency of firing, then the weight associated with the pain will grow. And the same thing is true for all of these processors. You, you can build in what the weight should be uh, depending on how these uh, 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 nerves, uh, what the nerves do. Uh, the same thing is true for joy. I, I don't know of anything like a neuron, a nerves for joy, but there is in the brain itself, there are cells that are very much concerned with, uh, with stuff like joy. And uh, if more and m more of those fire, then you get a higher weight for joy. Uh, the way this stuff goes up is like this. Pain minus five, joy plus three, they get together. Which one is going to go up? Well, pain has the greater magnitude weight. See, the, forget the sign. The five is bigger than the three. So pain will go up. And it goes up, but with a weight equal to the sum. Minus five plus three is minus two. Uh, now, this is how the model is working. I'm not saying that that's what's going on in the brain. But you could ask yourself, well, according to this, gee, is it true that if you have very strong pain and very great pleasure, that the two will subtract? That the pain and the pleasure can subtract? And so there are questions like this which one could ask about the real brain. And you know, I have. I, th I think this is reasonable. You go to a dentist. Have you ever had laughing gas? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wonderful, wonderful experience. <laughs> and the dentist is told, you 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 give enough laughing gas so that they don't feel the pain, but not more. Not more. It's sort of like the laughing gas is bringing pleasure uh, to the point where it offsets the pain. <coughs> and if you go too far, then you get manic, and uh, you, you don't want that. And when you're supposed to be, uh, he's supposed to be working on the tooth. So, and so here you see pain, fear, which goes up? Which goes up? Fear, because it's got a greater magnitude. And what does, and what does it go up with? Seven. Ma negative seven, good. That's uh, Anjali. Ange 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 okay, there it is, fear minus seven, thank you. And uh, so, so it goes up. So these are things that could be tested, actually, if you want to do. But uh, this is what the model is requiring. And the extent to which it's true, I don't know. Uh, let me also add to this model some complications that I don't really like. But I need to, because there are some processors that need to have be able to see what the external input looks like. And you can have lines from the external input going to really to all processors. That's a lot of lines but at least to the processors that need them, and also lines going up to the uh, external output. And uh, this is the summary slide. This is the model right here. Okay. One of the questions that I'm sometimes asked is, what about connections between individual processors? Shouldn't they be there? But it turns out if there are 10 to the 11th processors down here, and if there were all pairs of connections, that would be what? 
10, if all pairs were connected, 10 to the 22nd. That's close to Avogadro's number. That's a big number. It's just, you're not going to have that in the brain. So you can't have all of that. But, uh, so I'm not putting any of it in. I'm not having those. Although one could do the following. You could say that if uh, uh, face, a face processor asks, uh, if, the, uh, if the face and the fear talk to each other at some point, maybe you ask what the face name is and something comes up from fear, uh, this is something to be afraid of, then maybe if the face and fear talk to each other, I could imagine fibers growing between the two that would allow more direct. Uh, but in this model, uh, if they're going to talk to each other, the information has to go up, it's got to come back down. Okay. So... Let's see, oh yeah, so another important point here is no central executive. Um, so Bernie Barr's model has a central executive that sort of runs the show. And um, Turing Machine has a central executive, a finite state part of the machine, which runs the show. Here, there's no central executive, but that's only because w that that the, the stuff that the central executive does could be done by one of these processors down here. So I, I don't have a central executive, uh, e e even though others might think it's necessary. You, you don't need it. Uh, some other details. Uh, well, as I've already said, each un yeah, I mentioned each unconscious processor has a unique fixed address. It's not necessarily an address like in the computer, but there's a way of locating it. There is a way to locate each particular processor. And uh, there, this processor that's going up maybe has to do with fear. Um, uh, uh, this processor has with it some associated information. Uh, that's a tiger. You don't want to get too close. And uh, there's a weight asso associated with that. And so the, what I showed is pairs are really triples, which are the address, the information, and the weight. And the weight is a measure of the importance assigned to getting that information up to the stage. The information like look for faces or the request, what's that face name? Okay. Some more details. How are weights assigned to various processors? So I've talked, uh, I've ta mentioned already that it's how many n pain ner nerves are firing and how what frequency they're firing that determines the weight. Uh, there's a context process. There's a processor there that's concerned just with where, how did you get to be here and how, what are you doing here? You may be wondering that yourself. So anyway, so <laughs> context processor, uh, and uh, that's uh, uh, available also. Or, uh, to, to go up as needed. Um, it turned, uh, so, okay, let's keep on going. Uh, oh, yeah, oh, this one's cute. A task that has been put off. Do you, do you ever feel that that task that you put off starts to nag you <laughs> after a while? So I, I'm pretty sure that the weight of that task grows as a function of its importance and the length of time it's been put off. Okay, so. Here are details. Um, how I've already talked to you about how these, this information moves up and uh, the weight, so I've talked about that. Uh, more details, you know, a lot of details, and still not enough. Let's see, what's this one? The content, uh, yeah, this is the fact that uh, what's, the, the, the size of the short-term memory, very, very small. It's something called George Miller's Law. It's from way back, 1955. George Miller said, you can have at most seven plus or minus two chunks in uh, consciousness. Seven plus one. He didn't say what a chunk was. <laughs> <laughs> so he gave examples. He said it could be a digit, it could be a letter, it could be a word, could even be a poem that you've memorized. So I'm, I'll tell you the definition of a chunk, at least in this model. The definition of a chunk is it's that, it's that triple. It's the, um, it's the address and the information. It's really that pair. It's the address. The chunk is that location, the processor that, that you're looking at, and the information it's carrying. 
uh, is, is bringing you, the, the name of the face. And in humans, that, there's a con that constant is 7 plus or minus 2. So I already mentioned why you want a small number. Let's keep on going. So uh, this is just, I'm repeating myself. A chunk is an address information pair. A particular chunk that is often on stage is the pair address of processor supplying context and the information associated with it. Uh, another chunk on stage may focus on a particular task, such as driving a car. Another chunk might be concerned with texting. You know how, what a bad idea that is. There's not enough space to have a lot of there, room there. Okay, so I'll give you an example of how this sort of thing works. Uh, this is, have you read Oliver Sacks? He's, uh, oh, you, you want to, you say no, but you really should, this is a wonderful read. He's a, a, a physician and he wrote, wrote these books and he unfortunately just recently died. But each one of his books gives you an example of how uh, this stuff is working. It's just beautiful. And uh, he, he describes, uh, he liked hiking. He describes going to Sw uh, the Swiss Alps and uh, hiking up in the Swiss Alps. And he says, uh, very nice. Uh, he saw this field. Um, uh, he saw a sign. The sign said, beware the bull. He looked, no bull. He kept on going. And he went over a ridge and he saw the bull. And he saw the bull starting to rise on its haunches. And this scared the living daylights out of him. And he turned around and ran as fast as he could out of that field. And he didn't stop till he got out. And he noticed that he had damaged, he had damaged his leg. He actually had torn a ligament, which, by the way, is very, it kept him in the hospital for more than a month afterwards because it was really bad tear. But he had not noticed that the ligament was torn until he got out of that field. And so the, the idea here is that you can imagine that uh, this long, the, there is a processor there that's concerned with fear. In, in uh, our brain, it's the amygdala. But it doesn't, that doesn't matter. It's the, the point is that there is a processor that concentrates on fear. And uh, uh, there's possible responses to fear. One of them is fight, and the other is flight. There's also freeze. <laughs> fight, flight, freeze. I, OK, so in this particular case, in his particular case, flight won out. It took over, and it got up to the stage, turn, run, and it, it got up there, and it, didn't, it, took a, it did not allow any other processor up on the stage. Only when that fear got reduced did the pain actually manage to come up. So we'll see, that'll be an example. Uh, let's see, conscious Turing machine. Oh, uh, yeah, so the conscious, so, okay, so this, this, this thing is saying that uh, uh, there's an architecture and dynamics involved here. The architecture is this very tiny short-term memory that I've talked to you about, this enormous long-term memory, and then the contents of the short-term memory are being steadily broadcast, and uh, the processors, the long-term memory processors, negotiate amongst themselves to decide what gets up there. Okay, so that's the, ar that's the architecture I'm talking about. David, that's what's not been built. So, okay, so the uh, content of the short-term memory, and uh, we're going to suggest that this, we're going to give you a definition. Uh, well, the, what you've just seen is m uh, most of the definition of the conscious Turing machine. There's some details left out, but that's the definition. And now I want to say how we, theoretical computer scientists, define consciousness. Want the definition? Consciousness is what's up in that short-term memory. That's it. That's the definition. Now this will seem very, very strange to you. You're just defining. Is it really? I mean, is that what's conscious? But in fact, that's the, what, what we theoretical computer scientists do. We do things like give a definition to something, and then uh, 
later by proving theorems and showing the consequences, maybe you'll agree that that's a good definition, or maybe you'll disagree, and it has to be improved. Uh, we, we, so I, I'm telling you that consciousness, in this model at least, is just what's in that short-term memory. And, uh, but we suggest why this definition is reasonable. Why is that a reasonable definition of consciousness? Because every single processor in your brain is aware of what's going on there. That is what you are conscious of. That is what you see, feel, hear. Every single processor is aware of that. Okay. Uh, which long term, okay, so now here are a few things. I want to be able to get to the, um, the agony and the ecstasy. So I don't know how much of this I'm going to be able to get to. Uh, there are a few things that my definition of, our definition of consciousness requires. Uh, inner speech, because you do all speak to yourself. And by inner speech, I think, you know, m my dog has inner dogish. He is definitely speaking to himself in some language, and that's how they can get. So by inner speech, I mean something, for, it could be inner vision, inner odor. I don't know what it is, but there's some way to do planning. There is self-awareness, self-awareness, because we have it up on that stage a model of ourselves. It's that model which, you know, like Yoda, we try, you, we, we try to lift that rock. There's a model of ourselves for doing that. And then there is motivation. Uh, it's desire plus energy. You need to be motivated. You need to have motivation for something. Uh, by the way, uh, so all of these can be explained in more detail. Uh, I love the one for motivation. Uh, let's see if I can... I want to do something. I, I got these hidden slides here, so I want to... I want to show you something interesting what happens when you don't have motivation. So, what's going on? There's connection, self-aware. Anybody? Computers does not have motivation. Okay. <laughs> Entertainment. Okay. Here, here's, here's something that's a, a, re, a re interesting disorder that some people have. Uh, it's called left hemispatial neglect. This is somebody with left hemispatial neglect. They, uh, they are simply unconscious of what's going on. They can see what's going on on the left. They know about it, but they're not consciously aware of it. So if you ask them to draw a, a pic the pictures on the left, that clock, you see how the picture gets drawn. The house, the flower. Uh, this is a patient with left side neglect. They are not, it's funny, they're not really aware of the fact that they're neglecting anything. You put food in front of them, food, and uh, they eat just what's on the right half side of the plate. And uh, they're still hungry. It does not, a, they don't turn, you, you can turn around the plate and then they'll eat what's, what's left. But what's going on here? How, how, how come they didn't turn it around themselves? Because they are unconscious of it. It's simply they are not conscious. They are not motivated uh, to look at that. Okay. Uh, here are some, so those are the three things I, I, I require in my definition of consciousness. Here are a bunch of things that, uh, at least in human, human, there are people who don't have this stuff, and they're fully conscious. There are people who cannot create new memories. There was this wonderful person, H.M., uh, whom we now know as Henry Molaisen, who, because of an operation, was unable to create new memories. He had all his old memories, but like no new memories ever got, got created. He was conscious. So you see declarative memory creation is there. Language for outer speech, well, there are people who don't speak, but they are conscious. So I put it here in red because that's not a requirement for consciousness. Uh, face recognition, there are people who simply cannot recognize, they see faces, but they can't recognize their daughter, their son, their wife, 
they can't recognize themselves in the mirror. It's a funny thing, when the fusiform face area goes, you can lose the ability to recognize yourself. So each of these things uh, are things where in, there is somebody who doesn't feel that. There's this woman, e uh, S uh, SM, who is to totally fearless. Her amygdala has calcified. She's not afraid of anything. Oh, it's, she's got two kids, too. But it's, okay, let's keep on going. I want to explain a few things here. Free will, emotions such as pain and joy, motivation, I've talked. I'm just going to go directly to pain. Uh, 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 you know, if you want to, you can ask me later. I mean, the explanation for free will is simple and beautiful. You have free will. Um, you, you know, there's this problem about free will. How, how, how can we have free will? Uh, Samuel Johnson said, it was a beautiful statement. He said, all science is against the freedom of the will. He lived around the time of Newton. He knew that from Newton's F equals MA, all science is against the freedom of the will. Everything's determined. All experience is for it. What a wonderful paradox. And uh, so uh, th this can be explained here in this model that, that say you're playing, you want to play chess, uh, you have to make a move. It's your turn. You, you must make a move. And uh, you, you know that you can either move this piece over here or this piece over there, and you don't know which which you're going to do until you've sort of done some computation as much as you can to try to figure out which is the better move. And until you figure that out, you, have, you are free to choose which you, you will do. Anyway, that, that, that can be turned into an explanation of free will. I don't want to get into it. So there's uh, lots, lots about free will. This is what I want to get to. The question how to engineer a machine so it really feels emotions. Oh, you know, I could, uh, how do I get back to slide? Uh, <laughs> Thank you, appreciate that. Well, brains are very slow. <laughs> okay, next question. How to engineer a machine so it really feels, not just simulates emotions. This is a thing that most, that some people, many people say, well, it's impossible. You cannot answer that. Forget it. And that's what I am wanting to answer. Uh, now, I'm not, don't, it's going to be hard for me to convince you. I, in order to convince you, uh, I need you to accept, first of all, that consciousness has a physical explanation. If you don't believe that, then you might as well go, because it's, uh, nothing I say will help. And I'm saying it does have a physical. I need you to accept that it has a physical explanation. And I'm saying that something like the conscious Turing machine is a credible model for consciousness. Okay. I need you to accept that for the moment. You can change your mind after you go, but if you accept it for now, then I'll be able to uh, uh, tell you, uh, give you some ideas how this, this is done. So how the conscious Turing machine, CTM, generates consciousness, that I still have to explain. Uh, here's a point about the fact that, you know, many explanations involve different chemicals, and, you know, I'm obviously not going to be happy with that because knowing the name of a chemical doesn't necessarily tell you how that, that experience gets created, uh, especially not in a robot. And I want this to explain con robot consciousness. And the robot probably won't have these chemicals. So, you know, Lenore would like me to start with an explanation of how the brain engineers joy, pleasure. She does not like that I start with pain, but it turns out <laughs> that pain is somewhat easier to explain. And then I do often get the question, why would you, why would you engineer a machine to feel pain? <coughs> Indeed, why? So one answer. Any, anybody answer? Why? Yes? Like if you want to travel through like some kind of cliff area and then falls down, you don't want the robot to fall down. You want it to be, yes. 
machines are expensive. You want them to take care of themselves. Angelique. The way we think is really influenced by the emotions we feel. Like, if we were just, if we didn't have emotion, we might as well just teach the robot to read off Wikipedia, because then it would, it would just read knowledge, pure knowledge. But part of being conscious is being able to connect emotions to the way we talk and the way we process different things. <coughs> That's good. That's good. Uh, uh, so yes, uh, very good. Le uh, why would you engineer a machine to feel pain? You know, if you understand how pain is generated, there's also the possibility of engineering it to feel pain when it injures you. And that's one of the things that I'm especially interested in. To make it. I mean, right now we have mirror neurons which help us to feel other people's pain, but we could make it so it really feels uh, pain when it injures you. So there's a uh, 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 reason to at least understand pain. Uh, so let me explain to you the problem. I'm going to be sticking now to pain rather than pleasure or, or other possibilities. Pain. Uh, so to ex explain, I want to explain the problem of simulating versus experiencing pain. Uh, uh, and I, the, the one way to understand this is the, 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 a disorder called pain asymbolia. You can look up asymbolia, it's very interesting, but it has to have pain in front, pain asymbolia. People with pain asymbolia know about their pain. You can. You can cut them, they know they're being cut. You can pinch them, they know how hard you're pinching them, where you're pinching them. If, it, if there's a, if something hot or cold, they know how hot or how cold it is. They know, they can explain it all in vivid detail, but they don't suffer. In fact, they often giggle. They're, they're, I see, uh, you can find on YouTube this woman who's being pinched and pulled and everything, and she's laughing. It's, uh, they, they, they can do this uh, even with very, when there's very great pain. The, uh, w d would you like that? <laughs> You're saying no. Yeah, good. That, 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 you, you should be saying no. The kids that are born with this, some kids are born with pain asymbolia, they rarely live past the age of three. Mm. I did see one kid that lived to age five, and uh, I've heard it uh, continues to live now because after a certain age they understand English, they can be told, they'll understand. This kid, beautiful child when she was born, but, but before age three they had to remove all her teeth because she was biting her lips and her tongue. And, and, uh, and then she did learn that she should watch out, but she was playing ball and her foot must have gone into a hole or something and she broke her leg. And uh, she knew that she had broken her leg because she fe feels it but doesn't suffer. And she knew she'd been told she should stop, but she was having fun. Mm -hmm. So now when you see her, you see one leg is shorter than the other. These are the problems that come up. Pain asymbolia. The robots that we build nowadays are like pain asymbolic people. They can simulate, but they don't yet feel. And it's that kind of feeling that I want to explain. So I'm going to start with extreme pain, the worst possible kind of pain. Uh, make, so how does the body engineer the feeling of extreme pain? Make the machine, so I've thought of many ways to try to do this, and I've been unhappy with them. Here, the idea is make the machine unable to do anything except concentrate on the pain. Pain, when it gets up into your conscious mind of its pain, does not allow anything else up there. You are forced to think about it. <coughs> All attention on the pain, take away free choice. Under severe pain, you can't do anything else. Any processor that tries getting on stage gets immediately pushed back by the pain. Let me mention, I've said there are some things that I, I don't buy, uh, suggestions that don't work, as attested to by asymbolics, uh, make the reactions to pain automatic, like the finger pulling away from the flame, 
or generate sweat and increase the heart rate, or given a heavy or dangerous load, make the muscles vibrate. You know, and, and the really terrible pain, you can get nauseous, you can vomit. These sorts of things are, do occur, can occur, but they're not what's causing, they are not what's causing the pain. The que uh, but there's still the question, is loss of control enough? Does the machine really feel real pain when it loses free will and is forced to pay attention to pain? Um, a partial answer, think of the loss of control suffered when someone screams relentlessly into your ear. But this is still not enough. So let's take a look at a special case. How does the body engineer the instant shock of pain? And the explanation for that is that that shock is because every single processor is being interrupted. There is this thing called an interrupt. Whatever that processor is doing, it is forced to stop and to pay attention elsewhere. When a ligament is torn, the shock of pain is instantaneous. How does that excruciating pain come about? And we suggest that severe pain interrupts what takes place on stage. The interrupt travels down the tree to all unconscious processors, forcing each and every processor to attend on the spot to the interrupt. And uh, this, okay, so we propose the sudden interrupt of all processing systems registers as shock. Um, I, uh, do you buy that? As the explanation for pain? Um, I can tell you this, under conditions that produce great pain, asymbolics can still think, while normals cannot. You are normal, under extreme pain, you just can't think. It's actually a bad design. When you probably really should be thinking, because you want to get away from that, you cannot. You simply cannot. Asymbolics can. It's wonderful to see, you know, great pain, but they can. Okay, bad design. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop with that. Um, uh, thank, uh, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? <coughs> Dave? Uh, do you think the largest computers today are big enough to um, create robot consciousness? Uh, yeah, so I do think the biggest computers, the question is, are the biggest computers big enough? The Titan uh, supercomputer has uh, 1.7 times 10 to the 15 transistors, and that's roughly what uh, the number of synapses in our brain a little more than the number of synapses. We have like 1.3 times 10 to the 15th synapses. Uh, I, I, I think that's, I think the, uh, the answer is that, the, I think that there's enough. Yes? So I, I understood from you that you define free will as when you're thinking about, and you're computing a decision, like when you're thinking about your next chess move. Does, does it follow from that that the more intelligent that the person is, the less free will it has because the more quickly can make a decision? You know, the, 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 the fact is that there are some things, like in chess, where, in, in many things, where it takes a certain amount of time to do that computation, no matter how smart you are. Even the very best machines, they cannot create, make instant decisions. Just as we know there are some things, some functions that a machine can compute, that can't, a machine can compute, we know there are some functions that a machine cannot compute quickly. But the faster, not, not instantly, but the faster that they can do it, yes. follow that the less free will they, they have, um, according to your definition. Uh, uh, I, that's a very interesting point. Thank you. I, uh, uh, I have to think about that. Uh, does it mean that they have less free will or just their clock is faster? Yes? You mentioned that Information flows down fast, back up slow. What's the reason for the fast and slow? Fast down because the information just is being split out and sent to everything. There's no de decisions having to be made. Whereas on the way back, fear and pain collide and one of them gets to go up. So a decision has to be made. Not a bi big one, but it has to be made and all the way up. And that takes time. 
Has that a conscious Turing machine been built yet, or? No, no. Uh, there, there's this question, uh, I would like to see one built, and there's this question of how we will know that we succeeded, that we have actually built a conscious machine. It's because we didn't build in it that it should scream when it feels pain, but it screams when it feels pain. So you based your definition on what's necessary for consciousness based on what people can live without. Like, you can live without being able to recognize other people's faces. But then people who can't feel pain are also conscious, aren't they? So wouldn't that mean that, conscious, that pain isn't necessary? Yes, and it's one of the things on that list oh. of not necessary. That's a good point. So, like, why focus on pain and fear and joy if you don't consider them necessary for consciousness? Uh, well, I. Uh, because I, I, even though I don't consider them necessary for consciousness, I want to understand how this hard problem is solved. I want to understand how the, uh, the agony of pain comes about. It's, uh, you're, you're right, it's sort of further down. Yes? Um, is the drive to create the Turing machine more based on like, the innovation of itself? Or is it more like... No, I didn't understand that. So, say again? Is the motivation to create like the Turing machine for the purpose of innovation for itself, or is it like more uh, in fear of creating, of innovating too far without the machine? Like, like um, are you asking why we might want to build such a machine? Yeah, like, is it is it just for the purpose of innovation, or is it uh, like? I I well for. for I, if, if, you know, one of the problems that we have with our current machines is that there's a machine that plays Go and it plays really good Go, and there's a machine that plays chess, and there are machines to do lots of individual things, but one of the problems has been, how do you get a machine to, that can do everything? And one of the motivations is to come up with, it, to come up with this architecture is because now a lot of that doesn't have to be built in to be able to come up with it. Uh, How would you like teach the machine? Like, would you have it like look at? I mean, sort of the experiences of like a human, and then like learn different things from that, or like I don't know. Don't know yet. We have. Uh, it's a good question. Don't know yet. You see, this is all just on, on the being done now. How would you be able to differentiate? if the machine has actually learned to feel or whether it has just learned to imitate? Uh, because we're not going to build into it. I mean, this is, we are not build, building it to, to scream when they feel pain, when they sense pain. It just, that would come about because, for some other reason. We want these feelings to emerge from this general architecture without the spe specifics being built in. Uh, I, th I think, yes, let me take this one last question. We're gonna stop um, so, if pain is like for self preservation right? Like when I touch a button, I want to stop with this, like, or I will burn my hand, then what is, why are we like testing human situations when like a robot doesn't necessarily need to from a flame. It doesn't, I don't expect the pain, the robot to feel pain from a flame if it's, uh, the pain, will, there will be other things, you know, that will, that should cause it pain. There are others. I don't, I'm not trying to make this robot respond the way we do. I'm trying to make it respond the way um, this entity should, should respond. Thank you very much. Thank you.